Hi, everyone. My name is Iris Leonardi. I am one of the school psychologists at the secondary program for, uh, at Perkins School for the Blind. Give me like five minutes and then I'll be able to speak normally once I get the initial nerves out. Um, and I asked, didn't ask for the extra battery, but now it's not working. <laughs> Thank you for your help. I can click the screen, that works. If I touch the screen, this works. Okay. So I am gonna be speaking about psych evals. You probably already know that because of the agenda, but also about how they, how they can help and why they matter. Um, school psychologists don't often get to work with students with visual impairments or with blindness or deaf blindness. So it's not a common population they interact with. It's a very low incidence disability category. So this is just um, who I am. And so I'm, like I, like I said, I'm one of the school psychologists um, in the secondary school. Um, so I've been a school psychologist for four years now. Uh, I started in Cambridge Public Schools working in their special start program where I worked to transition students who are receiving early intervention services into the special education system. So I really was um, working with the two and a half to three year olds, um, getting them enrolled at in public school once they hit that three year mark and getting them their first IEP. Um, I also uh, interned here at Perkins before I became a school psychologist. I did my internship under Megan Schmidl and I really enjoyed it. And I also have been a PCA um, for deafblind students since 2017, which has been a joy. Um, I still see her when I can from time to time, but she also is a student at Perkins. So as you can see, I really love Perkins. <laughs> Um, so psych evaluation, why do they matter? Um, so what is this psych evaluation? So a school psychologist or a psychologist typically perform um, a psychological or psychoeducational evaluation in most cases. Um, some states will call the school psychologist something different or a neuropsych, a neurologist, someone who is a developmental pediatrician, developmental psychologist, someone like that might also conduct these evaluations. Um, they are either usually called a psychoeducational evaluation, which is very common for public schools, and then, or they could be called just a psychological evaluation. Um, as you can see, I have, I lost my train of thought at the end of that sentence, but um, a psychoeducational evaluation is one that will include information about academic achievement and cognitive achievement, whereas a psychological evaluation generally doesn't include achievement, which is academic performance. Um, typically, these evaluations contain a, for, a formal assessment of cognitive, cognitive or intellectual functioning, um, commonly known as IQ testing, um, emotional functioning, behavioral functioning, social functioning, executive functioning, and adaptive functioning. Um, there can also be specific assessments of specific areas like autism spectrum disorder, ADHD, and specific learning disabilities. Typically, those are evaluated through rating scales or observational data. And then one of the most essential uh, factors of an intellectual or cognitive test is the standardization that is used with these tools to evaluate, which kind of poses a problem when you're working with a low incidence population. Um, so to speak a little bit more to that, if you know, there aren't a ton of psychological testing materials available to those with visual impairments, which can make it really challenging, but we will talk about that a little bit more later. Um, so psychological evaluations are almost always included as a part of the initial evaluation for special education services, and they're used to determine eligibility. And then every three years or so, they can be re they will be redone as part of the triennial reevaluation. Um, 
So for a student who is going to receive special education services throughout their entire academic career, conducting a psychological evaluation during elementary, middle, and secondary year, school years is best practice and not necessarily every three years. Um, it can be really uh, dysregulating and challenging for students to continuously have to go through this evaluation process. Um, and so if you can do it as little as possible, that's usually the best way to do it. Um, psychological evaluations provide data to quantify the impact of a student's disability on their ability to access the general education curriculum. And that is what all special education services are born from. They all come from the access to the general education being impacted by the disability. Ooh. Thank you. So this is the part where the advocacy comes in. So if you have a child who needs a psychological evaluation, there are certain questions you can ask to make sure that you're advocating for the appropriate evaluation for this child. So an important consideration is what is the level of familiarity that the evaluator has with this specific disability? Like I said, visual impairment, blindness, deaf blindness is a really low incidence disability. It's about 1% of all special education students. So most Professionals don't actually interact with these students on a regular basis, and some might only interact with one or two in their entire career. So some questions that I recommend asking is, did the evaluator adapt the assessment procedures to account for sensory impairment? Did they make sure to enlarge materials if a student can access them visually? Did they look into other types of evaluation tools like braille tests or tests that come with large print already or tests that are just auditory and don't require any visuals? The next type of question to ask is, did the evaluator include language that tells the reader to interpret the results cautiously because the tools aren't standardized on students with sensory impairments. That is incredibly important when considering any evaluation report because if they're not including that information, then they haven't really considered the impact of a student's disability on their ability to ask, access the testing materials. So if they're not able to include that in their report, it's not giving the reader that warning that something needs to be considered with a grain of salt because of the visual impairment. And then the last question is, was a teacher of the visually impaired or TVI consulted or included on the IEP team? The answer should always be yes, especially if there's already an established history of visual impairment, blindness, or deaf blindness. Um, in some cases, for deaf blindness, you might have a, a teacher who isn't a TBI, but is instead trained to work with specifically deaf blind children. So I think that would be the only caveat I would give to that. But it's really making sure that you have the experts in the room when you're evaluating a child with a visual impairment. And like I said, most psychologists don't have a specialty in this area and don't have a regular interaction interview with, in this area or with this population. So bringing in the TVI, who its entire career is focused on this population, it is imperative. So when I say standardized on a population, that could mean anything. So what I mean is every cognitive assessment that is worth its salt uh, will conduct normative assessments before the test is published to establish what average, above average, below average, et cetera, is for the general population. So they usually will have at least 4,000 to sometimes more, to all around like 10,000 different people from different backgrounds um, take these assessments to get the normative and standardized data. Again, visual impairment, very low incidence in the earlier years. 
So they're not typically included in the normative population because it's seen as too much of a um, confounding variable. So because of this, there usually isn't good data within the manuals or the test materials themselves that can address this. So, and there are very few cognitive assessments that are standardized for the visually impaired, blind or deafblind populations. And those ones that do exist are generally not accepted as the gold standard for cognitive assessments, unfortunately. So it leads to the question, why do these assessments even matter? Why would we even do them if they're not relevant to the student sitting in front of us? And I think it's because Unfortunately, we don't live in a world where the world is adapted for all and it's universally accessible. And these, report, these results will be really important to consider for future planning because once students leave special education, they will be compared to the general population through their adulthood and their, the rest of their entire life. And as someone who is in the secondary school, focusing on transition in the future is probably the most important thing you could do for a child with a visual impairment, especially if they have multiple disabilities. Um, multiple disabilities is something that, you know, can be served better, but the more data and historic evidence you have to support that, the better. The better positioned you are for your child or the, a student's future and supporting them through that process. Because if, you don't start planning from day one, uh, the last day can really sneak up on you and the more prepared, you, you can never be too prepared. So I think, start thinking about it now if you haven't started. So for specific tests for the deafblind population, there are no standardized tests for the deafblind population. Um, the deafblind population is about 0.05% of the special education population. So very, very niche and specialized um, and not a big enough pool of people to actually form a normative sample from because it's so low incidence. And it's also very low incidence. The, the disabilities or chromosomal anomalies or all of the different things that could cause deaf blindness are also really low incidence, like charge syndrome. Um, there is something called the home talk and it is a non-standardized interview tool for two parents of deafblind children. And it was developed specifically for that purpose. So having access to someone who knows about these things is really important because if you don't know what you don't know, it's hard to know what to look for. Um, and also standardized assessments would be adapted or usually are adapted based on a student's access level in addition to their visual and auditory profile. So what this means is the way we deliver the test, as much as we can, we stick to standardization because once you deviate from standardization, it's really hard to provide cognitive scores or any scores because you're not following the procedures as they're outlined in the manual. However, you can still provide quantitative or qualitative, there we go, qualitative data to really talk about what the child can do what type of adaptations did you make so that the child could access the testing at their level? And then based on the adaptations you make, you really can build up their educational recommendations based on what you saw worked and what you saw wasn't effective. Some of these adaptations might be, like I said earlier, enlarging print, providing brailled materials, providing different um, textured materials, tactiles, um, maybe a lot of times we just skip certain subtests because they, it's not fair to give to a student, even if they have some functional vision, because, for example, processing speed, a child with a visual impairment will naturally visually process information slower, but that doesn't necessarily mean that their process, their cognitive process is, is slower. It's their visual field that is the challenge and the barrier to the processing, which is different than the cognitive processing. So they might be able to auditorially process information fairly quickly, but visually it can only they can only access some information to have it solidified. 
So for specific tests for the visually impaired or blind population, there are some that have been adapted to Braille or to large print. Um, these are the ones that are, I include ones that for, are for younger students, since this is the early connections convention. Um, but I did um, wanted, I wanted to make sure I included the Woodcock Johnson as well. So I don't typically use the Bohm or the Brigance or ooh, the Brigance, but I know people who love them and they really find them, they find the, the ability to use them with this population, which is great. So they, the Bohm uh, includes tactile objects or enlarged images, which is great, especially for the younger kids. Obviously for the enlarged images, a student would need some functional vision. For the brigands, that's going to be more of their, their academic or achievement skills, like math and ELA, and they um, include large print, contracted braille, or uncontracted braille. And this um, is a really great one that, that can you you can really start at the younger age and work your way through the test, so you can really see what level a student's at. This is great for a lot of different age levels, even if it maxes out at a certain age, just because you can really see the progression of, of the academic progress a student is making through their academic career. And then um, there's the Woodcock Johnson 4. So there's three different versions of the Woodcock Johnson. There's the cognitive functioning test. So that's the typical IQ test. There's the academic achievement and the oral language. So that's something an SLP might use. Um, they come in three different types. You have the large print, uncontracted braille, contracted braille, or Nemeth braille, which is um, math braille. So those are really great for students to access. But in some cases, those ones aren't accepted by certain agencies for when down the line, going back to transition, you have to apply for DDS, Department of Developmental Services, services, um, just because they really rely on certain tests to make sure that what you're comparing is accurate and you're comparing it to something that has well-established history of testing, standardization, normative process. So that's going to be like the Wexler um, Intelligence Scale for Children, the WISC, or the Wexler Adult Intelligence Scale, the WACE, or I don't think I can do the whipsy one, but it's Wexler something, something, something intelligence. <laughs> um, but the Woodcock Johnson is one of those tests that is accepted by some agencies. So it's really making sure that your child or student is being evaluated with the right tools throughout their entire academic career, because that really establishes a roadmap for their future and making sure that their future includes their ability to access services. I was going to say that CPH now has the UEB map supplement too. Ooh. So it's not just the NEMA, but if you're in a, like we're a state that's full UEB for math, they now have that supplement that you can get for Woodcock Johnson for. Okay, there you go. The breaking news there is now the math supplement, math supplement UEB. Did I get it right? For uh, the Woodcock Johnson, which is great. Um, so uh, the next one, the next part is about psychological evaluation and how they can help. I have to fix one thing. So oh. it's captioning. So I just need one second. No problem. The perfect opportunity to get water. No problem. I'm flying through my slides, though. Just heads up, everyone. So, more time for questions. Good point, Justine. All right. How are they going to help? I guess we'll find out. My my button's not working. Thank you. Yep. Okay. Thank you. 
So how are these results gonna be used? Um, through direct testing, we can assess how a student is doing in different areas of development to guide teaching practices, inform areas for intervention, and determine eligibility for special education and adult services. I think the first psych evaluation a student ever gets is for the last one, determining eligibility, and that's to determine if there is something neurological or intellectually going on that might be a consideration for special education services. So this might be a disability classification that they end up accessing um, through the cognitive evaluation. However, there are much more a lot more goes into a cognitive or a psychological evaluation than just the cognitive piece. That's just the piece that is the hardest to do for students with visual impairments, deaf blindness or blindness. Um, there, there's also rating scales that we use a lot to evaluate social, emotional, behavioral functioning, adaptive rating scales to evaluate conceptual, practical, and social functioning. And those are really also important considerations for certain diagnoses like intellectual disability, developmental delay, or autism. So one of the most important things a psychological evaluation can provide is data that indicate a need for in-school services. So they can include behavioral intervention. So that might be the, working with directly with the BCBA, a uh, board certified behavior analyst to address any maladaptive or concerning behaviors that a student might be engaging in, um, figuring out what the function of that behavior is and how can we support a student's behaviorally to be able to make sure that they're able to access the that general education curriculum to the best of their ability. Um, what it can also include a recommendation for in-school counseling services, group or individual. That's something a lot of our students really access here at Perkins. Uh, a lot of, I would say most of the students in secondary in, have access to at least some type of counseling service, whether that's group or individual or um, something that students with visual impairments, blindness or deaf blindness go through is that really intense uh, awareness of being different and needing more support than a typically developing child. And counseling is really important in that regard because it can help them work through that, figure out ways to cope with that in, that in ways that are beneficial to them. And that can be students on any side of the spectrum. A lot of students with more severe disabilities still get counseling services, and that's how we really serve them. We access, we help to support them at the level that they're at and help to teach them what they need to know based on what can they understand and how can we have them help? How can we help them to access that piece of themselves? Another service that can be added through a psych eval is ongoing consultation. So a lot of times um, you can put that right in the IEP, it's in the section under services, it's in the grid A. Um, and that can provide an ongoing consultation with parents, teachers, or other caregivers to help work through problems or to provide uh, help for challenging behaviors, checking in on interventions to make sure they're effective and that they're going to be, um, and that they're being applied with fidelity. So it's really that check-in process that can be part of the IEP as well. And then finally, um, a psych eval can also include uh, academic support. So that might be through identifying certain gap areas and skills, or it could be identifying a, spe a specific learning disability like a SLD, which could be dyslexia, dysgraphia, dyscalculia, something like that, where they are struggling with a certain area of academics. So they might struggle with reading. That might be something that can inform them that they need a reading specialist, or they need more support around literacy. And then finally, um, psychological evaluations can provide data that supports service delivery once a student um, transitions to adult services. So here I am again talking about transition, and it's really important that these psych evals, if you're doing them on the right best practice uh, schedule, are done with a professional that knows how to address the specific population because historic psych evaluations can really be the make or break for a case for adult services. 
um, if you haven't had that historic data that supports either intellectual disability, autism, so, um, significant support needs, then it really can impact your ability to access these services after you're out of the special education system because the special education system can sometimes support certain needs off of an IEP or they can provide more support than the IEP specifically outlines. And then while I understand why we do that, what it actually does is it hinders the child's access to those supports in the future when they need them the most because because of that cliff that kind of can come when you exit special education and enter adult services. It can really be um, something that can really build your case. So I, I really recommend making sure that you're doing these on a consistent basis. And here I am again, talking about transition. Um, and I will sound like a broken clock, but it's never start too early to start planning for a student to transition to adult services. Historic psych evaluations help to establish the developmental nature of specific disabilities like autism and intellectual disability. And students without historical documentation of a disability can lead to service denial in the future. So I pretty much just had my entire slide on the last one, but there it is written down for you. And like I said, I flew through my slides. Um, I thank you all for being here and listening. Um, some other things I would love to talk about regarding psych evals is that making sure that you're not afraid to go through them. Um, sometimes when you are testing a student with certain tools that are not meant for that student, it can feel unfair, but the test results never really, at least in my case and at Perkins, don't impact what we value a student for. A student is who they are, and this test just provides us more information about who they are and what they need to thrive, and that's okay. Being on any end of the spectrum at any part of the bell curve is okay, and it doesn't make you better, worse. Everybody is equal no matter where they fall on that bell curve. It just tells us what we need to do to support that child or that student or that adult. So that's what I'll leave you with, unless there's questions. It was really interesting how you said about like, oh, sorry, Zoom, yep. Hi, um, my question is about thinking about that trajectory of doing like one psych during the elementary and the middle and the high school ages. And I thought that was great. And thinking about that historical context, um, is there a recommended time or space for an outside neuropsych, which might give some different information like within that trajectory? That's a great question. So outside neuropsychs are an option that can be explored. Um, you can, if you're not uh, satisfied with the evaluation that your public school district gave you, you can request an outside evaluation. We actually do them here, shout out Matt. <laughs> um, so, you know, making sure that you're getting the results or you're getting the evaluation quality that you want is really important. But if you're not, sometimes you have to go outside a district and sometimes you can do that through an outside evaluation, or you could go through the medical route, which is more of a neuropsychologist, a neurologist, a developmental pediatrician. Um, those typically are great to explore when you're looking for a diagnosis specifically, um, like autism or intellectual disability, developmental delay, anything along those lines, because while school psychologists can provide you an educational diagnosis, it's not a medical diagnosis. And a medical diagnosis is also very important for adult services. So making sure that you're addressing those concerns through your either your insurance, whether that's private or public insurance. Typically, public insurance does provide support to access these testing services. However, the wait list can be long. So the earlier, the better, especially for developmental disorders like autism or intellectual disability, because the earlier you find these types of disabilities, the more, the more quickly you can access services and the better outcomes you tend to see. Just because the longer you have access to service, the more you can learn over time, especially with the um, outside or the expanded core curriculum skills, the skills that we don't learn, that our students may not learn through um, implicit learning because they don't have access to visuals. Thanks, Kate. Good question. 
Oh, yeah. <laughs> I was just wondering if you could talk about how you work with the TBI, either, I think you, maybe you do it differently here on Perkins, maybe then it might be out in the public school setting, but how you work with the TBI either during the actual testing or in prep for the testing. That's a great question. So you, you are correct in that, in your assumption, we do it a little different at Perkins just because we have more access to this population and a lot of experience working with this population. However, in the public school setting, I think pulling in the TBI is always a great idea. So the way to do that is to really meet with them well in advance of testing. Uh, the reason is because you're gonna need to know exactly what the student will need to best access those test materials, whether that's slant board, whether that's uh, a lot of professionals that don't work with this population regularly, they hear visual impairment and they just assume no vision. However, we all, you know, there's a big spectrum of vision out there between being able to see 2020 and being blind. So that doesn't necessarily mean that they won't be able to access anything visually. It's just that they might need more support. So it's making sure you're meeting with them before they they actually go through it. And then if you're noticing things while you're doing the testing, maybe pausing what you're doing, and then consulting with the TVI. Having TVI in the room is always a great idea too, because they might be able to problem solve right in the moment. And they generally are usually good at MacGyvering things to make a mark. Uh, that's something I've definitely learned about TVIs is that they can usually make, make it work no matter how that ends up going. But it's always good to consult them throughout the process. And then even when you're writing up your report, I think it's a good time to really consult with them as well, because making sure you're phrasing things correctly, you're including the right developmental history, medical history, and information that is important to how you interpret the report and the test results. So I think two questions. First would be, um, are the psych evals here at Perkins considered a medical diagnosis? Um, so at Perkins, we do not provide medical diagnosis. They're not a neuropsych. It's just a, we're just regular school psychologists. Um, so to get a neuropsych, typically you have to go to like a children's hospital. I know Boston Children's Hospital does them. There's some other agencies that really focus on the neurological or neuropsych process of testing. So it's really making sure you're looking for those PhD professionals to provide those diagnoses. Perfect. So my son and I have had the privilege of coming here to do a, a, a psych eval here or a, an assessment here, um, but we've also sought out a diagnosis of like Dartmouth-Hitchcock. And um, so I'm wondering, do you have any insight to like a parent who is seeking out a neuropsych um, eval? Um, so for my child who's completely congenitally blind, a lot of these assessors don't have experience with blindness. Yep. And so we are just pushing up, you know, we're facing barriers in that because they don't have the experience. And so there's a lot of question about the diagnosis. It just doesn't feel solidified. Yep. We see that a lot. So the way we deal with this here at Perkins is um, me and my colleague, Alessia Guerrero, we tend to write psych reports that have some a section called diagnostic considerations. And what we'll do is we'll actually just put the DSM criteria for whatever it is that we think the student might be showing symptoms for, whether that's autism, intellectual disability. I say intellectual disability because we work with students who are 14 plus. Um, if you're younger than not nine or younger, then you qualify for developmental delay. But eventually that does go away at that nine-year-old mark, and you have to qualify for another eligibility classification. But back to your question. So to like you said, and like I was saying earlier about all psychologists, this is such a low incidence population that even, you know, people with PhD levels often don't interact with this population. They don't, they identify that they don't have that specialty, so they don't ever feel comfortable doing certain things. So when we write up our psych report, we will compare the diagnostic criteria, and we'll also talk about why this is autism and not just part of being blind, because a lot of Professionals will talk about how a student who might walk really heavily in their chair, oh, that's just, you know, a blindism. When in reality, you can, if there's a difference, there's a difference between seeking sensory input because it helps you know your, your space in location because you can hear the difference in your body positioning changing. And there's a difference between seeking that input because your body needs that sensory processing support. 
Um, and yes, you are completely correct that a lot of professionals have that challenge. And it's really making sure that you're going to the people that do know this population in, in whatever way you can. There are, I think, I'm going to butcher the name, but it's like a neurological opt optician. Um, and those do exist. And you can typically get a little bit further with them. Or it's consulting with or going over your evaluations that you had at Perkins and bringing those to your provider. That's what we generally recommend that you bring them to your pediatrician or your medical doctor so they can read them through. And we do really comprehensive and thorough reports here so that you can bring it to the people that are a little more unsure about what the diagnosis may be because they don't feel comfortable making that determination because they think it's just a blindism when in reality, it's more than that. And then you have the problem where you don't have that historic data and back to transition and yes. So I know exactly what you're talking about. Awesome. Yes. Any in the chat? Yeah, we have one question from the chat. Um, the question is the quote, developmental guidelines for infants with visual impairment end quote, has visually appropriate assessment items from standardized assessments, such as the Bailey, Real, et cetera, organized by age cohort. Would you recommend this tool in EI? Yeah, I think it's a little different for students that are at that younger age because visual development is just part of regular development. So it's making sure they're hitting those visual milestones, making sure, you know, within the one month mark that paying attention to faces is something that they're really focused on at the two month mark, making sure that, you know, their pattern recognition is coming through, that they are recognizing familiar people and not just familiar voices. And I think, so I think having those tools employed in early intervention makes sense because it can really make sure you're um, identifying anything that might be going on that we, that might be missed because a lot of times educators spend a lot of time one-on-one -on -one with a child. So having those types of typical developmental evaluations are, I think, an okay thing to do. And the Bailey is a well-established cognitive evaluation. So I think that would be okay also. It's just, they don't make the, a bit, the Bailey for adults, unfortunately. So it can only go so far. Awesome. No more questions. Awesome. Chat, yeah. Well, thank you, everyone. I appreciate your time today. And I hope that you guys have a good night. And it's like getting out of class early. <laughs> <laughs>